not a cure, and doctors knew that it wasn't a cure at the time, but they did it because that's what Joe ordered them to do. And it made her incapacitated and rendered her basically a vegetable with limited skills and verbality. Uh, rather than the, uh, the public asking questions or chastising Kennedy for that decision, he had her locked away at St. Coletta, which was a mental institution in Jefferson, Wisconsin. Uh, another biographer would write that Rosemary, unlike, uh, or excuse me, that Rosemary likely suffered from learning disabilities mixed with some form of bipolar. Uh, at 11 years old, she was sent to a special school for learning disabilities. After that, they sent her to Elmhurst in Providence, Rhode Island, which was a Catholic convent. In agreement with the convent, Joe Kennedy bought them an expansive tennis court in return for them to keep quiet about Rosemary. As she aged, she would be shipped from one institution to another and began sneaking out to meet boys at night, which somewhat proves that she wasn't stupid, she was not inferior, she was not invalid, and was really fully capable of having some sort of relationship. When Joe finds out that she was sneaking out to meet the boys, he went to the school and he beat her senseless. And that's when Joe would have her locked out, locked down out of fear that she would embarrass the family name and damage any political aspirations the family might have. Joe then decided to have a forced lobotomy on her, but he never even tells his wife that he's going to do this. James W. Watts, who carried out the procedure with Walter Freeman, both of George Washington University School of Medicine, described the procedure to Kessler as follows verbatim. After Rosemary was mildly sedated, we went through the top of the head, Dr. Watts recalled. I think she was awake. She had a mild tranquilizer. I made a surgical incision in the brain through the skull. It was near the front. It was on both sides. We just made a small incision, no more than an inch. The instrument Dr. Watts used looked like a butter knife. He swung it up and down to cut the brain tissue. As we put, in, as we put the instrument inside, he said, as Dr. Watts cut... Dr. Freeman asked Rosemary some basic questions. For example, he asked her to recite the Lord's Prayer or sing God Bless America or count backwards. We made an estimate on how far to cut based on how she responded. When Rosemary began, began to become incoherent, they stopped immediately. Watts told Kessler that in his opinion, and this is just disgusting, but Watts tells Kessler in his opinion that Rosemary didn't have mental retardation whatsoever, but she rather had a form of depression. A review of all of the papers written by the two doctors confirmed that Watts was right. She wasn't retarded. She wasn't slow. She had depression. All of the patients the two doctors lobotomized were diagnosed as having some form of mental disorder. So this surgery was not needed on any level. It's disgusting. She was then shipped off, and for another 20 years, nobody was allowed to know where she was, and nobody was allowed to visit her. She was left all alone with caretakers. Joe refused to tell his wife where she was, nor did Joe tell any of her siblings where she was or what had happened to her. She would outlive them all by dying at age 86 in Wisconsin with Teddy Kennedy by her side who adored her. It's just another example of what a piece of shit Joe Kennedy really was. Who would order that done to their child? Yes, and I know the time period that we're talking about, that was sort of common practice. But even when the doctors told him, listen, she's not retarded, she's not crazy, she just, she has issues. I don't care, cut her head open. It just, it's just disgusting. Who could do that to their own child? Uh, by many accounts, John uh, Kennedy was a poor student, but he excelled at history and English, but he still got into an elite boarding school in Connecticut called Choate. And a letter penned by John uh, from his father while John was at Choate shows what a complete asshole Joe Kennedy really was. And this is the letter which I have in front of me. Now, Jack, I don't want to give the impression that I'm a nagger. For goodness knows, I think that is the worst thing any parent could ever be. And I also feel that, you know, if I didn't really feel you had the goods... I would be most charitable in my attitude towards your failings. After long experience in sizing up people, I definitely know you have the goods and you can go a long way. It is very difficult to make up fundamentals that you have neglected when you were very young. And that is why I'm urging you to just do the best you very can. I am not expecting very much at all. And I will not be disappointed if you don't turn out to be a real genius. 
but I think you can be a worthwhile citizen with good judgment and understanding. And that letter is half insulting, half wishing, and just an asshole thing to say. By the way, I know you're not capable of anything. You're not really smart. You didn't really learn anything. I'm not expecting you to be a brain scientist, but at least accomplish something. What a jerk off. A fucking, just a complete and utter jerk off. Uh, John was not Joe's choice for politics. His beloved Joe Jr. was. But we all kind of know what happened there. John would graduate from Choate in 1936 and would enter Harvard, where his brother Joe was already attending, based and uh, and it's amazing based uh, on that letter that John even got into Harvard. He, <laughs> but there has been a lot of things to suggest that Joe, in fact, got John into Harvard with some money, and not based on John's acumen or his intelligence or his SAT scores. John would be an average student at Harvard and would play football and would wind up suffering an injury that would end up rupturing a disc in his spine. Uh, and that injury would affect him the rest of his life, which is why he was taking opioids and or not opioids, marijuana and acid and everything else while he was in office. Um, over the holidays of that year, John's second year at the dinner table, Joe announced that Joe Kennedy Jr. would be the first Irish Catholic American president in United States history. Uh, so much for having to live up to his expectations. Uh, John didn't have much interest in politics or even really in business at that time. And he was an average student at best who just liked history. He just didn't really know where he was going, which most college students don't. Uh, it's not until their third year that they kind of figure out what they're going to do. But you're the son of Joe Kennedy. So, you know, uh, in 1937, as Jojo the Creep Show is named the U.S. ambassador to England, the entire family would move to England except for Joe Jr. and John, who remain behind at Harvard. It's only after Joe is named ambassador that John comes becomes interested in sort of world affairs and especially Europe, excuse me, European politics in general. Both Joe and John would travel to Europe and work for their father at the United States Embassy, which how do you get that job when you're a college student? It's just ridiculous. But it's going to be sort of the trajectory that we're going to go on here. In 1939, John would travel throughout Europe, including the Soviet Union, the Balkans, and the Middle East in preparation for his Harvard senior thesis. Then he would end up going to Berlin. And it's no shock that his thesis is entitled, Why Great Britain is Unprepared to Go to War with Germany. And John was basically a chip off the old block when it came to his father's uncanny, uncanny abilities to be anti-Semitic, the same as Joe Jr. was. The book, a book would be penned after that uh, paper and it would be renamed Why England Slept. Uh, while John was in Berlin, a U.S. diplomatic representative would hand John a secret coded message for his father. And that message claimed that war was soon to break out and Hitler had desires about world domination. John would hand that message to his father after returning from Czechoslovakia. John would return to London on September 1st of 1939, the day that Germany invo invaded Poland to mark the beginning of World War II. Two days after it began, the Kennedy family was in the House of Commons in England giving speeches to endorse the United Kingdom's declaration of war against Germany, which is something the Kennedys were completely against. We already know that, that uh, Jojo the shit show was uh, completely against that as well. John would then be sent by his father's representative to help with the arrangements of the American survivors of the SS and uh, Athena before flying back to the United States. In his junior year at Harvard, John would begin to really sort of get into politics, specifically political philosophy. Uh, he would end up making the dean's list, which absolutely stunned his father. As we said earlier, uh, that book then would be published on his paper uh, and it became a bestseller. Uh, and basically the book, he addressed Britain's unwillingness to strengthen its military to the lead up to World War II. And the book also called for an Anglo-American alliance against the rising totalitarian powers. Kennedy became increasingly supportive of the U.S. intervention in World War II, and his father's isolationist beliefs resulted in the latter's dismissal as the ambassador to the United Kingdom. And we know why they threw Kennedy the fuck out of London. Uh, and this created a split between Kennedy and the Roosevelt families. So in 1940, Kennedy would graduate from Harvard, and then he would enroll at Stanford Graduate School of Business. He would leave Stanford and would then help his father write a book, and then he would travel through South America. John's intent was then to enroll at Yale Law School, but when it was imminent that the United States was going to enter the war, he opted out of Yale. 
Kennedy then attempts to enter the Army's officer candidate school, but would be medically disqualified. John would go to his father for help, who made arrangements with Alan Kirk, who at that time was the director of Naval Reserve Naval Intelligence, and he gets John into the United States Naval Reserves without a question. Uh, Once again, going to daddy, daddy fixes everything. John would then be commissioned as an ensign on October 26th of 1941. Joe as well joined the Navy and he would become a pilot and would be sent to Europe. In January of 1942, John was stationed in the Office of Naval Intelligence in Charleston, South Carolina. He would attend Naval Reserve Officer Training School at Northwestern University from July 27th uh, to September 27th, and then would volunteer for Motor Torpedo Boat Squadron's Training Center in Melville, Rhode Island. October 10th, he would be promoted to Lieutenant Junior Grade. Kennedy's first command would be a PT-101 from December 7th of 42 to February 23rd of 43, and it was a torpedo patrol boat used for training while Kennedy was an instructor at Melville. He would then lead three more PT boats, the PT-98, the PT-99, and the PT-101, which were being relocated from Melville, Rhode Island to Jacksonville, Florida. During that trip, he would be hospitalized after diving in cold water to fix a propeller. Shortly after that, he would be sent to Panama and then to the Pacific Theater, where he would command two other PT boats. In April of 1943, Kennedy then gets assigned to the Mo, uh, excuse me, the mortar. Oh God, the Motor Torpedo Squadron Two. And then on April 24th, he took command of PT-109 which was based at the time of the Tulagi Island of the Solomons. On the night of August 1st to the 2nd, in support of the New Georgia campaign, PT-109 was on its 31st mission with 14 other PTs ordered to block or repel four Japanese destroyers and float planes that were carrying food supplies and 900 Japanese soldier to the Villa Plantation garrison on the southern tip of the Solomons Kolombangara Island. Intelligence had been sent to Kennedy's commander, Thomas G. Warfeld, expecting the arrival of the large Japanese naval force that would pass on the evening of August 1st. Of the 24 torpedoes fired that night by eight of the American PT boats, not a single fucking one hit the Japanese convoy. On that dark and moonless night, Kennedy spotted a Japanese destroyer heading north on its return from the base of Kolombangara around 2 o'clock in the morning, and he attempted to turn to attack when PT-109 was rammed suddenly at an angle and cut in half by the destroyer uh, Amagiri, killing two PT-109 crew members. Kennedy gathered around the wreckage uh, with his surviving 10 crew members, crew members to vote on whether to fight or to surrender. Kennedy stated, there is nothing in a book about a situation like this. A lot of you men have families and some of you have children. What do you want to do? I have nothing to lose. Shunning surrender around 2 p.m. on August 2nd, the men swam towards the Plum Pudding Island, 3.5 miles southwest of the remains of PT-109. Despite re-injuring his back on collision, Kennedy towed a badly burned crewman through the water to the island with a life jacket strap clenched between his teeth. At least that's what they say he did. Uh, I have a hard time buying any of that shit. Kennedy made an additional two mile swim to, on the night of August 2nd, 43 to the Ferguson passage to attempt to hail a passing American PT boat to expedite his crew's rescue and attempt to make the trip on a subsequent night and a damaged canoe found on the Naru Island where he had swum with Ensign George Ross to look for food. Once again, I don't believe any of this shit. On August 4th of 1943, he, he and his executive officer, Ensign Lenny, Lenny Tom assisted his injured and hungry crew on a demanding swim 3.7 miles southeast to Olasana Island, which was visible from Plum Island. They swam against a strong current. And once again, Kennedy towed his badly burned motor machinist, Pappy McMahon, by his life vest. Uh, the somewhat larger Olasana Island had ripe coconut trees, but still no fresh water. On the following day, August 5th, Kennedy and Ensign George Ross made the one-hour swim, but these motherfuckers did nothing but swim for four days. They made the one-hour swim to Naro Island, in addition, an additional distance of 0.5 miles southwest in search of help and food. Kennedy and Ross found a small canoe. Somehow he magically finds fucking canoes everywhere. Packages of crackers. 
candy and a 50 gallon drum of drinkable water left by the Japanese, which Kennedy paddled another half mile back to Olasana in the acquired canoe to provide his hungry crew. I don't buy any of this. I'm just saying native coast watchers, Biku Gasa and Enroni Kumana first discovered the 109 crew on Olasana, Olasana Island and they paddled their messages. They, excuse me. Yeah, they, this is what it says. They paddled their messages to Ben Kivu, a senior scout who sent them on to Coast Watcher, Lieutenant Reginald Evans. On the morning of August 7th, Evans radioed the PT base on Rendova. Lieutenant Bud Liebenau, a friend of the former tent mate of Kennedy's, rescued Kennedy and his crew on Olasana, Olasana Island on August 8th of 1943 aboard his boat PT-1057. After a month's recovery, Kennedy returned to duty commanding the PT-59. He and his crew removed the original torpedo tubes and depth charges and refitted the vessel into a heavily armed gunboat mounting two automatic 40mm guns and 10 50 caliber mounting machine guns. The new plan involved attaching a gunboat to each PT boat section, adding a gun range and defensive power against barges and shore batteries which the 59 went on to encounter on several occasions from mid-October to mid-November. On October 8th of 1943, Kennedy was promoted to full lieutenant. On November 2nd, uh, Kennedy's PT-59 took part with two other PTs in the successful rescue of 40 to 50 Marines. The 59 acted as a shield from shore fire and protected them as they escaped on two rescue landing craft at the base of Warrior River, in Chola Seal Island, taking 10 Marines aboard and delivering them to safety. Under doctor's orders, Kennedy was relieved of his command of PT-59 on November 18th and sent to the hospital on Tulagi. From there, he returned to the United States in early January of 1944. After receiving treatment for his back injury, he was released from active duty in late 1944. Kennedy then was hospitalized at the Chelsea Naval, Naval Hospital in Chelsea, Massachusetts from May to December 1944. On June 12th, he was presented with the Navy and Marine Corps Medal for his heroic actions on August 1st to the 2nd, 1943, and the Purple Heart for his back injury while on the PT-109. Uh, beginning in January of 1945, Kennedy spent three more months recovering from his back surgery, back injury at Castle Hot Springs, a resort and temporary military hospital in Arizona. And this is the part where I start to get disgusted because number one, you, they can't prove that he did any of this. And it's long been asserted that many of the exploits that took place for those eight days were not exactly true and that they were inflated and that Joe Kennedy helped inflate them. Anyway, after the war, Kennedy felt that the medal he had received for her heroism was not a combat award and asked that he be reconsidered for the silver star for which he had been recommended initially. Kennedy's father, Jojo, the shit show requested that his son definitely receive the silver star, which is awarded for gallantry in action. On August 12th of 1944, Kennedy's older brother, Joe Jr., a Navy pilot, is killed while on special and hazardous air mission for which he had volunteered. His basically explosive laden plane blew up uh, when its bomb detonated prematurely over the English Channel. On March 1st of 1945, Kennedy retires from the Navy Reserve on physical disability and was honorably discharged with the full rank of lieutenant. When later asked how he became a war hero, Kennedy joked, it was easy. They cut my PT boat in half. In 1950, the Department of the Navy offered Kennedy a bronze star in recognition of his service, which he declined, and rightfully so. Uh, Joe Sr. had always wanted Joe Jr. to be the first Catholic president in the United States history, but with his death, Joe needed to begin to apply pressure to John. With the death of Joe, John was tapped to be his replacement, whether he liked it or not. So in the summer of 1945, Joe Kennedy wanted to bring the family's limelight and heroism to the forefront. He formed a, a ship launching ceremony. The ship, which was named the USS Joe P. Kennedy Jr. Uh, and he wanted all the press that he could get there to remind voters that the Kennedy family wasn't going anywhere. And that his two sons, Joe and John were war heroes. And that's kind of pushing it to some extent. 
Then Boston Mayor Maurice Tobin secretly discusses the possibility of John running as his running mate in 1946 as a candidate for lieutenant governor. Joe and Maurice had many discussions about it, but Joe did not want John as a governor. Uh, and that's mainly because he knew his son couldn't win that. He had no political, t- really, he had no experience. He just had no experience. But what he did was he wanted his son in Washington. And the reason why he wanted him there was because Joe could manipulate Washington politics and politicians. And he also knew that his son would get more national visibility, which makes kind of sense. So in 1946, some very surreptitious shit begins to happen. And some very surreptitious shit goes down. United States Representative James Michael Curley, who had been in politics his entire goddamn life, suddenly, for no other reason, vacates his seat in the insanely strong Democratic 11th Congressional Congressional District of Massachusetts. Now, Curley, who had serious debt, okay, uh, was given an offer by Joe Kennedy. Kennedy would pay off all of his debts, all of his liens, and then some if Curley just vacated the seat. And then he would ensure that Curley uh, would win a sweeping mayoral race in Boston if he showed if he wanted to do that. Not only did Joe Joe Kennedy pay off all his bills, pay him well, but he also covered all of the fucking finances for Curley's mayoral race. And in return, guess what Curley does? <laughs> so Curley agrees, right? And it's worth noting that Curley, during his fourth mayoral position, there would be investigations galore against him, including bribery, war profiteering, and mail fraud. He would eventually go to prison for some of that stuff. But as a special side dish to all of that, who do you think gave the information to the authorities about Curley's actions? That's right, Joe Kennedy. And that's what Joe always did. He used people to his advantage and then he would cripple them behind the scenes so that any backlash or any subtle idea that one might come back at Kennedy was nullified immediately. He did this in his entire life. And some may call that incredibly smart, uh, but at best it's dubious. It's evil. But that's what made Joe Kennedy, Joe Kennedy. Without Curly walking away, there was 0% that John could ever get the Democratic support from the 11th District. And let's be frank about it. John Kennedy's entire fucking life, all of his accolades were bought and paid for many times over. You don't need proof. It's all there in black and white. And so let me let me explain something. Look at his military career. He couldn't get into the military. He was disqualified for medical reasons. His father pushes a button. And what is amazing by this, even if his father could push that button, he would still have to pass boot camp. He appears to somehow never have had to go to boot camp. It's amazing. He appears to, you know, somehow he goes from a nobody and he ends up at Naval Intelligence School. That's not possible by any naval standard. That's not how it works. You go to boot camp and then you're sent off to AIT school or officer training school in your specific required and yet tested field. How does someone skip boot camp and head directly to naval intelligence? How does that happen? It, it doesn't. Let me explain. My father, just so you know, he entered college at Missouri University as an ROTC cadet. After graduating, he was sent to George Washington University. From there, he went to boot camp. Then he was a commissioned officer. He toiled from ship to ship to ship and eventually ends up in Vietnam. And my father was a lieutenant commander in the United States Navy. Okay. He was a lieutenant commander in Vietnam. He was, he, my father's job in Vietnam was he was on those lagoon patrol boats with the 50 caliber machine guns going through the lagoons, killing people. That's what my father did. My father as a result of Vietnam was awarded the bronze star and the silver star. Those are facts for heroic actions. Kennedy's heroic actions, if they're even real, aren't even believable. And I'm not trying to knock anybody that was that served the U.S. military. Please don't get me wrong. But when you start to look at the Kennedys and then you start to look for information that any of these things happen, nobody corroborates it. One person. I don't believe that John F. Kennedy was a war hero for any fucking second. I just don't. I don't believe half of that shit. 
I don't believe half of it. And I'm, I'm not listening. I'm not being unfair. He served. He served this country. But I take umbrance with how this whole entire family has bought and paid for everything. My father earned a bronze star and a silver star. Thank you very fucking much. Uh, I, I believe the Kennedy's heroic actions. There's some, I think that some are true, but I think most of it's stretched. And he wasn't even given a silver star till after his daddy bitched about it. It's not like the military said, we're going to give you a silver star because you earned this in combat. No, daddy had to throw a shit fit. And then suddenly the military changes. That's not how the military operates. And John Kennedy should have been ashamed of that. If they offer it and they give it to you because you, you've you earned it, 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 it's you are a war hero when you earn a silver star and a bronze star. Not everybody gets that. You have to do some serious shit and be in a hostile environment, and you have to save a lot of lives to get that. That's not just, you, you, don't, you just don't get that for sitting in a tent in Afghanistan and repairing drones. That's not how it works. And there's a huge difference between what Kennedy did and my father did. Do I know what my father did? No, I don't. He would never talk about it. But I don't buy a lot of it. And there is nothing to corroborate any of that. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I, it's just how I am. Um, my father was a fucking war hero. Kennedy was a fucking poster boy. That's all Kennedy was. And, and that's my point about Kennedy. He earned nothing on his own fucking merits. Not Yale, not Stanford, not fucking Harvard. He couldn't get into Harvard. It was bought and paid for. He couldn't get into the U U.S. Navy. Bought and paid for. He wouldn't win an election. So what happens? It gets bought and paid for. And just when you think that Kennedy was somehow different or by proxy smarter, he was gifted. He was no more gifted than the boy who asked for the pony and got it. And what Kennedy got handed after war was because of daddy and the chief complaints of his father. That's not honorable. It's selfish and it's a prick thing to do. And so with Curly vacating his seat, there's a lot of work to do for John F. Kennedy. John had barely a clue as to what to do, but daddy was about to step in and run the show for John. He didn't give a fuck about John be John's beliefs. He didn't give a fuck about any of his stances. He knew this was his one shot to get his name in papers and to get involved in politics. And so when we come back next week, it's going to be the rise of JFK and company. And they often say, how you begin a story is how you end it. Or more aptly, live by the gun, die by the gun. Or never bite the hand that feeds you. Kennedy will learn, and all of the Kennedys are going to learn, that the sins of the father carry over tenfold. Kennedy's going to be really lucky to win his first race. But Joe has much bigger plans for John. And that's the White House. John can't do it without daddy's checkbook and without some of daddy's old friends. So come back next week for the next installment of the K. Hey, welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We are going to get into whatever part we're on. I think 9, 10, 11, whatever uh, of the Kennedy crime family. So last week we discussed Kennedy uh, and how he entered the Naval Reserves and how he got into the reserves despite being disqualified from day one. We also discussed how Kennedy was given a high position within the Navy at the behest of his father, Joe. And it's not to take away from Kennedy serving at all, uh, because he did want to serve. Uh, and he used his connections or his father's help to get in, uh, no matter what anyone says. Uh, Kennedy was in action. He saw action. So you, you can't really knock his military record. And last week, I, I wasn't trying to knock his service for this country, but there is kind of a, a caveat that comes along with that. Uh, I don't particularly believe that he did what people claimed he did. Uh, I also find it pretty disingenuous that they bitched about not getting a silver star. And, and to me, that's something that you just don't do as a serviceman. Uh, you have to be humble and et cetera. But Joe Kennedy knew he needed a silver star on his son, regardless he was going to claim both of that his sons were heroes. 
which is a word that gets thrown out a lot uh, for people who really aren't. Uh, sacrificing your life for this country, there is no bigger honor than that. But I think hero applied, that word did not apply to Joe nor John. I'm just going to say it. Uh, just my two cents. Um, and I think I probably just feel differently because of the, uh, you know, overbearing asshole that Joe Kennedy was. Accolades didn't seem to be something that was earned in that family. Uh, rather, it was something that was bought and paid for. So as you all know, uh, Kennedy leaves the military. Uh, Joe Kennedy throws a big gathering to celebrate a new ship launching called the Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. But most importantly, it was to showcase that his son, sons, at least in his eyes, were national heroes. Say what you want about Joe Kennedy. But he knew how to get attention the right way. And when you control the newspapers, you control what the public takes in. So as Joe Jr. is tragically killed, John gets tapped as the new poster boy for what Joe Kennedy wants to accomplish. He knows that John has experience in foreign affairs just from uh, having experiences overseas. But as far as being somebody who could possibly dictate policy, that was something else altogether different. Joe knows that John being Catholic is going to be a huge hurdle for him and for the Kennedy family in general. And John has to begin somewhere. Local politics were an important foundation, but Kennedy knows that local politicians held value only locally and that to be seen is to be heard, and to be heard is to be seen. And what Joe wants for his son is to have the world's eyes on him. Specifically, uh, he wants Washington's eyes on him. And it's better for John to use his war status in Washington rather back in Boston. At the time, as we said, Boston Mayor Maurice Tobin, who Kennedy owned, was considering running for governor. And he spoke to Joe about the possibility of John, John running for lieutenant government, uh, excuse me, lieutenant governor. It was in 1946, and Tobin thought John would make the perfect running mate. Joe declined because he wanted John to be a congressional, uh, be involved in a congressional campaign that would get John to Washington, D.C. And it just meant more national visibility. And that's what Joe felt was better for the family and for his son. And as we know, um, uh, and we said this last week, and I just want to catch everybody up, but the Kennedy, but Kennedy basically goes to the United States representative, James Michael Curley, who held the seat in the tough and staunch 11th congressional district of Massachusetts. And he asks him to vacate in return for him vacating that seat. He would back Curley financially and publicly to run for mayor of Boston. And I guess at the end of the day, he really didn't give two fucks about where he, wherever Maurice Tobin sat. Uh, so Curley vacates, which opens a chance for John Kennedy to run for that seat. Kennedy, at the behest of his father, moves an office to an apartment right across the street of the Massachusetts State House. The 11th Congressional District was a tough working class district in Boston. Joe Kennedy would back his son completely financially, which was a different move as Kennedy bypassed the Democratic District. So in other words, rather than rally support with fellow Democrats in that particular district, he bypassed all of them and he relied on his father and the friends of his father, Navy servicemen and wealthy friends to help him get the word out to back it uh, financially speaking. And it was a clever move that was orchestrated by Joe Kennedy on every level because the 11th Congressional District found something about him. If the if excuse me, if the 11th Congressional District found something they didn't like about him, he would be dead in the water. And if the district didn't like Joe Kennedy, they could easily back a rival and force Kennedy to the side. So by leaning on friends and personal finances, they were making their way on their own without having to worry about the trappings of just building alliances. So the slogan that was designed by Joe for his son, John, was the new generation offers the leader. Uh, Kennedy's points were to talk about the blue collar workers of Boston, keying in on better housing for military veterans, better health care for everybody across the board. He supported organized labor unions campaign for reasonable work hours, and he wanted a safer and healthier workplace and demanded them the right to organize, bargain and strike. He would uh, campaign for peace and campaign that the United States keep the Soviet Union in their place. And he had a strong opposition, uh, excuse me, opposition against them. In other words, plot points. Uh, Kennedy wasn't a man with a different viewpoint or really even a different voice. I mean, he was just like everybody else, but many had been careful speaking about unions and trying to avoid those sort of topics for obvious reasons. 
but Kennedy embraced them. And, and when it comes to unions, I don't think it's any secret as to why Kennedy made that a key point with his speeches. Unionization wasn't an old idea, but there were definitely two lines here when it came to the unions and Kennedy saying that they had the right to organize, they had the right to bargain, they had the right to strike was following a direct open policy for organized crime. Let's just not uh, bullshit each other here. Uh, Kenny, uh, Kennedy, interestingly here, mentions strikes, and we all know the mafia did not like strikes. They loathed it. So Kennedy mentioning all of these points isn't really a, a much of a shock because despite his slogans and his rhetoric and his jargon, uh, he was going back to the unions no matter what. So whatever public stance he took was not the private stance he took. Uh, and it's an optic whereby what he says he wants and what he's willing to back are, are two different, uh, completely different things. And those key points, and no doubt, was the policy of Joe Kennedy more than anybody. Uh, Joe Kennedy knew who ran the unions. He knew that the unions controlled the docks and helped make him and his family a fortune. So he knew that backing them uh, and putting John to task on that, at least privately, was an important position for John to take. Even in his first election, uh, he knew who wound the clock. So in 1946, the Democratic in the di Democratic primary, uh, he got double the votes than his closest opponent. At the election in November, he blew away his Republican counterpart. However, there was something very interesting about this race. Two of his Republican opponents were Italians from the West End. Joe Russo, who was from the West End, was a popular candidate and had been elected four times to city council before entering the primary. He was popular, uh, like immensely popular with the locals, and Kennedy and those around him worried themselves silly about Joe Russo. Uh, Russo was widely supported in the Italian community, hands down. They worried that the entire district would vote Italian over Irish. So what Joe Kennedy does is he goes to see some friends, and he explains to them that they need John to win this. The West End cannot vote Italian. They needed help. Kennedy was spending a ton of money, more money than Russo could come up with to sort of combat campaigns. And when whispers came back to the Russo campaign that Joe Kennedy was behind the scenes paying off people for votes, he went fucking berserk. Russo calls the East Boston leader uh, and places an ad advertisement in the paper. The head of the advertisement read this Congress seat for sale. No experience necessary. Applicant must live in New York or Florida. Only millionaires need apply. And that was a direct shot at Kennedy uh, not living in Boston and a direct shot at Joe Kennedy pulling strings from Florida and using mafia contacts to get Russo out of the way in the West End. The thing is, is that Russo had a lot of experience and Kennedy had none. He didn't have a single ounce of political experience acumen or viewpoints other than plot points that were given to him by his father. And this is when Joe gets even more dubious. Joe Kennedy, what he does is he uses mob contacts to pressure Joe Russo to sit down and shut the fuck up. When it didn't work, Joe Kennedy takes it another step further. He finds an unknown, he finds an unknown, a political unknown who also happens to have the same exact name, Joe Russo. This Joe Russo was 27 years old, had no political prow prowess, and was a janitor on the West End. Uh, Joseph Kane, who was John Kennedy's campaign manager, was paid by Joe Kennedy to approach this Joe Russo, who became known to Kennedy through the mafia in Boston, and this Joe Russo was paid to enter the race. The idea was, take this Joe, Ru Joe Russo, same name, and make him run. Give him whatever the fuck he wants. They knew that if they did that, there was no way that Joe Russo could win. Uh, but with the same name, they're going to confuse voters. And more importantly, it's going to split the votes. So in other words, if Joe Russo, the actual politician, is your main sort of objective, your main target, your main enemy in this race, let's go get another Joe Russo. People are going to get confused. So those two, two Joe Russos are going to split the votes, meaning there's no way John can lose. And it just, like I said, it just meant that Kennedy's only opposition would have to split those votes. So the first Joe Russo, the actual politician, when he finds out about this, because he does, he goes crazy. The pressure began to mount, and the second Joe Russo explained 
that uh, publicly because there was a lot of pressure. And the second Joe Russo, who was just a fucking janitor, explained mob guys came to him with a big bag of money and explained that he was going to run whether he liked it or not. And that the money came from Joe Kennedy. He explained that they gave him money. They offered him an apartment. They offered him whatever he wanted just to get the job done. So he did it. And most people would. So when the votes came in, it was pretty much a landslide. Kennedy got 22,183 votes. Joe Russo, number one, the actual politician, got 5,661. And Joe Russo, the number two, uh, who was the janitor, somehow managed to get almost 800 votes. And the central point is that even from the very beginning, Kennedy couldn't do it on his own. And yes, I mean, help is never a bad thing, right? But it's a glowing example of rigging or stacking the deck for yourself. And probably what's most egregious about this is the fact that Joe Kennedy wanted the accolades for himself. He didn't give a shit if John won because he was happy for his son. He wanted it for himself. Uh, and it just did more for him than it, 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 it did for John, at least albeit initially. So for the next six years, Kennedy did his thing. He would join the Labor and Education Committee and Veterans Affairs Affair Committees. He concentrated deeply on international affairs. He would go on to support the Truman Doctrine, and that doctrine basically laid uh, out a roadmap to support democracies against authoritarian threats. It began with the primary goal of containing Soviet geographic expansion during the Cold War. Uh, Truman would announce it to Congress on March 12th of 1947, and the dro doctrine would imply that American support for other nations threatened by Moscow uh, it was the early foundation for what we know today as NATO. Uh, Kennedy would go on to support public housing, and as we said, he would oppose the Labor Management Relation Acts of 1947. What's odd about it is that Kennedy was against the power of labor unions. So like I said, he comes out first in public support of it, then changes his sort of narrative when he wins an election, and now he comes out against it, but inwardly, uh, away from the public spotlight, he was not going to do anything that was going to impinge uh, organized labor union. And the reason why that this, this act was so important uh, on its face in, at the time, it was better known as the Taft Hartley act. It was a federal law that restricted the activities of labor unions. It came as a result of the strike wave strike wave of 1945 and 1946. And the strike wave took place right after world war II. Uh, more than 5 million American workers went on strike. Many of those protests were for better pay and for better working hours. Kennedy would then get into Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952, which required communists to register with the government. <laughs> Who the fuck if they're a communist is going to reg register with the government that they're a commie? In 1952, John F. Kennedy began to posture towards the Senate seat. He would pivot his target against Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., who was a three-term incumbent. Uh, Kennedy would run for run on the ma the mantra of Kennedy will do more for Massachusetts. Uh, once again, Joe Kennedy would step in and he would fund the entire campaign. John's younger brother, Bobby, would be named his campaign manager for that run. Kennedy knew he needed women to vote. So his mother and his sister would end up hosting meet and greets at very upscale hotels for tea, where they would talk about John and his beliefs and why they should vote for him. Uh, there would be a presidential election that year. Republican Dwight D. Eisenhower would win that election by 208,000 votes. Kennedy, however, would be lodged by 70,000 votes and would win his Senate seat. Now, because we mentioned Bobby, let's kind of drop back a little bit and discuss him because he is going to have an insanely active role in his brother's political life. Robert Francis Kennedy was born on November 25th, 1925 in Brookline, Massachusetts. He was the seventh of nine children to Joe and Rose. While many might think that Bobby and John were close, they actually weren't uh, because John was bedridden a lot and suffered seemingly one fucking ailment after another. He barely spent any time with Bobby, once remarking that he might have walked him down the street once or twice, but really didn't even know his little brother at all. Uh, Bobby never really got close to his brothers in his childhood and often had a hard time adjusting to the frequent moves from school to school, which made it hard for him to keep and contain friendships. And Bobby often spent the majority of his time alone and kept to himself. Uh, as a kid, he loved going to museums and loved history, and he adorned his walls with photos of U.S. presidents and collected books on the American Civil War, and he collected stamps. What a dork. 
I don't know. My father collected stamps. I probably shouldn't say that. So in March of 1938, he would sail with his mother to London and join his father, Joe, who had been named ambassador of the UK. He would attend the Gibbs School, which was a private school for boys. In 1939, he allegedly gave his first speech at a youth club called Cornerstone. Just prior to the breakout of World War II, Joe would send his wife and children back to the United States to protect them. And then he would flee to the goddamn countryside like a gutless coward fuck, uh, which brought him a ton of heat from the British press. In 1939, Bobby would begin school at St. Paul's. Now, St. Paul's was a Protestant prep school located in New Hampshire. Uh, it wasn't a school that Bobby really wanted to go to, but it was one that he was told that he was going to go to. And it was the school that Joe wanted Bobby to go to. Uh, while the Kennedys were staunch Catholics, Rose was upset that the school used a lot of Protestant rules. Uh, they used the Protestant Bible and she complained to Joe that they were Catholic and, and she's just not really cool with Protestant values. Joe told her it's my choice and you're going to do whatever I tell you to do. So for two months, she waited enraged, silently enraged and behind Joe's back while he was busy. She took Bobby out of St. Paul's and enrolled him in Portsmouth Priory School. Uh, and it fit her liking because it was a Benedictine Catholic boarding school in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, a part of her liking had to do with the fact that the boys had to read the Bible, took part in early morning prayers, nightly prayers, and, on, and went to Mass up to four times a week. And it ended on a Sunday with a huge Mass, which was very important to Rose. So what? one of the things I, I want to preface what I'm about to get into now is, is Bobby was a ranting fucking maniac. Uh, a bully, uh, uh, just a bastard in every stretch of the imagination. And a lot of people have always wondered why. Well, guess what? You're about to find out why. Uh, not that we like to go down psychological diatribes, but I think this is sort of important for the person Bobby is going to eventually become. Uh, so Bobby was a mama's boy uh, and his classmates would brutally and verbally attack Bobby daily, referring to Bobby as mommy's little boy, Bobby. Uh, Kennedy was encouraged to fight by Joe, especially any boy who insulted him or his mother. But Bobby wasn't a fighter. He was a soft kid and nothing like his brothers. And as you remember, Joe often forced the boys to fight, making them tough. And it seems like Joe Kennedy Jr. was really the only one of the Kennedys who really picked up that sort of tough bravado acumen. And by all accounts from the priests uh, and other students said that Bobby was a snob very unfriendly, never smiled, cried a lot, and complained nonstop about everything. His grades weren't that great, and through letters, his mother challenged him to study hard, work on his vocabulary, as it was very important. And history seemed to be really the only thing, that, the only subject that Bobby really was sort of able to excel at and retain. Once again, another Kennedy who was mediocre at best as far as uh, intelligence and studies. Uh, what is interesting about looking at his childhood, those roots itself, just in being bullied, right? Uh, and we've talked on this show specifically from a psychological aspect that what that does to kids, and perhaps in many ways, when we look at what Bobby would become later on down the road, the overbearing, backstabbing, blackmailing Bobby, he essentially becomes a kid who becomes the bully himself, adding to that many sort of deficiencies, he would become one part his father and one part utter bully. And that's one thing to be warped by an overbearing father. I think we can all understand that. Uh, someone who deflated his kids more than build them up. And when you add the bullying aspects of what Bobby would go through, it makes complete and utter sense as to why Bobby was about to become somewhat of a ranting fucking maniac. Uh, and it's not to excuse what he's going to do down the line. But it makes sense as to why he felt overrighteous and almost militant. Uh, it's also worth noting that Joe Kennedy verbally abused Bobby during his childhood, referring to him as a runt and openly complained that his son was soft. Bobby tried in vain to mimic his father's toughness, but he would be laughed at and chided when he attempted to appear tough, which deflated Bobby uh, and really uh, took Joe's interest in Bobby and, and threw it out the window. He had no interest in Bobby at all because Bobby was nothing to him. In 1942, uh, Kennedy once again transfers schools. Bobby ends up going to Milton Academy in Milton, Massachusetts and would do his junior and senior year of high school there. Uh, the reason why he was transferred there was because Joe had designs on Bobby going to Harvard. Joe forced Bobby to move and Bobby did as his father wanted. His grades would improve 
but just a little bit. Bobby would write letters home to his father about his thoughts on World War II and the different political events that were going on in the world. His father laughed at the letters and often read one or two lines, making fun of him to the other Kennedys and then throwing the letters away without ever responding. And that's a fucked up thing to do. Like your kid is trying to show interest in politics and the war and and, and sort of trying to blossom into something and you just shit all over him. What a fucking creep. I wish I could dig Joe Kennedy up and crack his skull. Ugh. And all that does is just drive Joe further away from Bobby. And as a result, Bobby would become the true epitome of a mama's boy. No matter what he did, Joe didn't care. And those seeds of doubt, the verbal abuse, the chastising would end up turning Bobby into an immoral opportunist who would do anything to obtain whatever he wanted. He would do whatever to attain his ambitions. He would become ruthless, just like his father. Outwardly, he'd appear compassionate. Inwardly, he seethed. So in 1943, Bobby would follow John's footsteps and he would join the United States Naval Reserves as a seaman apprentice. Insert your own jokes right there. <laughs> March of 1944, he would be released from active duty and reported to V-12 Navy College Training Program at Harvard. Once again, <laughs> Take away the military thing, right? Bobby didn't have the grades of the acumen to get into Harvard. Let's just be honest. This is another example of using the Navy and his father's pockets to get him into college. And, you know, that in all reality, he couldn't get in on his own. His father had to pay somebody. Uh, it's another example of daddy paving the way because he could not have a son go to what he considered a substandard college. Everything was optics and appearance with them. It would make Joe look bad, God forbid, if, if Bobby only got into Brown or, or the Boston College. Uh, it, it's just how Joe Kennedy was. So Bobby's V-12 training would begin at Harvard in 1944, and then he would be related to Bates Col uh, be relocated to Bates College in Lewiston, Maine. In June of 45, he would head back to Harvard, and then he would complete his training requirements in January of 1946. While he was in Maine, he had a hard time adjusting and he had a hard time learning and he felt totally inadequate. And that came from letters that he penned to a friend back in Boston. In one letter, he exclaimed, if he didn't get the hell out of Maine soon, Maine soon he was going to kill himself. While there, his brother Joe Kennedy Jr. Uh, is killed uh, in Mission Aphrodite over in Europe. And while Bobby was upset, there was also a part of him that was thankful in a sense because Bobby's importance in the hierarchy of the Kennedy family was about to change. So when Joe Kennedy was help, uh, when Joe Kennedy was helping christen the USS Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. destroyer, Bobby was actually in officer training school. Uh, he sat down with his father and he begged to be put on that ship. Joe would make some calls and Bobby would leave officer training and be placed on the ship, which was heading for the Caribbean and would serve as a seaman apprentice. Once again, insert your own filthy joke there. <laughs> by, by 1946, his tour of the military was over and he would be discharged. Oddly, he was awarded the American Campaign Medal and the World War II Victory Medal. Uh, it, and I laugh because it's like, you know, that that was a medal that was given to anybody that served between December 7th of 41 it's September 2nd of 45. Everybody got that. So it's not like he did anything super stupendous. Uh, in 1946, he would head back to Harvard. Uh, Bobby seemed to sort of begin to gain his father's attention when he goes on to play football at Harvard, despite being undersized. I think Bobby was like 5'10", 140, soaking wet. He actually played uh, an end, which is kind of creepy, but... Uh, but he was a ferocious player and he ended up breaking his leg, doesn't utter a word, gets up, wimps back to the line and just keeps playing. And that seemed to gain the respect of his father and his teammates. Bobby would go on in 1946, helping John and Joe in the campaign to get John elected after Joe purchased the seat of James Curley, which we talked about earlier. He would then join that campaign full time after he gets fully discharged by the Navy in 1948. Bobby would graduate Harvard University with a degree in political science. Uh, that summer, at his father's suggestion, he would sail with friends to Europe on the HMS Queen Mary for a tour of Europe and the Mideast. Joe wanted him to see how politics worked in other countries, and Joe also got him a co-op job with the Boston Post 
as a reporter, and he would write articles slamming the British for their anti-Palestinian uh, Palestinian views. He openly placed, uh, excuse me, praised Arabs and Jews as being tough and wanted to see Arabs and Jews come together. Uh, it was the complete polar opposite of his father's anti-Arab, anti-Jewish stance. Bobby correctly predicted that the Arabs and Jews would go to war because of the hatred of the two groups, which is too intense. So uh, now I got to say this. And while you might be sitting there saying, well, at least Bobby wasn't like John or Joe Jr. or Joe Sr. He wasn't an anti-Semite. Uh, but that's sort of coming down the pike. And it's just going to prove that he was a hypocrite in about as many ways as his fathers and his brothers were. In 1948, he enrolls at the University of Virginia Law School. And this is where Kennedy comes sort of into his own. Uh, and just so everybody knows, my brother went to UVA. University of Virginia. Uh, it is a completely waspy, wealthy I Ivy League type of school uh, where the Kennedys would totally fit in. Uh, he would be elected president of the Student Legal Forum and was able to attract uh, those uh, the who's who of speakers, including Joe McCarthy, and keep that name on your brain for later on. Uh, his father would even speak at UVA and John Kennedy would speak at UVA as well. Uh, and so the reason why I'm going to stop here is because we're going to get into some crazy shit next week. And every time I do this, you know, I get 35, 45, 55 minutes into the Kennedys. And I always don't want to push too far because we're getting to the point where John's going to start thinking about uh, Oval Office type of stuff. And there's so much that has to go in between that, that you got to pick the right place to stop. You really do. Uh, because next week it's going to be the rise of Bobby and John's going to, begin headway into the Senate and he would begin to have some designs on being a, a much bigger than a Senator. And the only way that John really has attained anything up until this point has been a result of his father and his father is about to pull the lever in a massive, I mean a massive way. And he's going to call in a favor that he never, in, uh, he's going to call in a favor with no intentions of ever repaying that back. And the results are going to be earth shattering in a million different ways, not only for the country, but for politics. And so next week, when we do come back, there's going to be a lot of different things we're going to have to discuss. And I've got to be careful because, like I said, I don't, I don't want to get into Kenny, Teddy, Teddy Kennedy and all of his lineage. I'm trying to keep it as basic as it gets, but it's, it's going to get bumpy from here on out. And the reason why I say it's going to get bumpy is because uh, – John is going to be start to posture. John's going to get married. Obviously, we know that the philandering is going to start. But when Joe Kennedy and John and the Kennedy crew or the clan or the Kennedy crime family gets together and decides John's going to run for president, there's a lot of things that need to happen. First of all, there's a big anti-Catholic sentiment in this country. It still is. But what you're going to see is they need votes and they need votes in states that won't support Catholics, West Virginia being specifically one of them. Uh, and so when Joe is sort of scheming and he's plotting out his son's course for him, he knows he's going to need help in these districts where they will not vote for a Catholic. Joe needs the help of what we call the boys and the boys are going to be more than willing to help more than willing to help. But Joe Kennedy doesn't exactly want to reach out to them on his own because Joe Kennedy is more familiar with East Coast gangsters than Midwest guys. And so while he could have used his East Coast contacts to get in touch with Midwest guys, he kind of needs a middleman. He needs a guy who not only has access to them, but can act as an emissary. But Joe thinks, wow, we could also use Hollywood to back my son because Hollywood has a lot of power not as much power, say, as, as organized crime, but in a different kind of way. So he needs somebody that can, at his behest, not only speak to organized crime members so that there's sort of a, 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 a fence between them because Joe didn't want to be caught talking to them. But if he can find a guy who not only could be the way station between the mob and Joe Kennedy, 
but could also somehow have the power to pull Hollywood in. Wow, that's a great idea. And so he picks up the phone and he calls Frank Sinatra. And that's where we're going to stop for this week. So come back next week for the next episode of the Kennedy Crime Family. Have a great weekend, everybody, and stay the fuck out of trouble.